Hello and welcome to Pixum Portraits 2020. If that sounds futuristic, it is. You survived the past, congratulations. You are the future. Speaking of the future, late last year, we looked at examples of retrofuturism in animation and got on the topic of audio animatronics or robotic animation. At the time, this was thought to be the future. And although they don't physically walk among us, today the relationship between humans and robots is harmonious. Algorithms make our lives easier in many ways. They make this wonderful world possible. In this series, we'll be looking at the connection between animatronics and the fear that robots will one day replace humans as the dominant being on Earth. This first video, the lighter one, will cover the history of audio animatronics and how we first program robots to listen, entertain, and even love us. Though Automata has existed for centuries, our story starts in 1939 with a robot and its dog. Designed and built by Westinghouse, Electro was introduced to the public at the New York World's Fair. It stood seven feet tall and was capable of responding to voice commands, instructing it to walk, speak, and, naturally, smoke. Electro's vocabulary was comprised of some 700 words with pre-recorded statements that were played off of a record player. Electro was joined months later by the adorable Sparko, a dog that could perform basic commands such as bark and sit down. This fair was followed up 25 years later in 1964. Now we looked at Walt Disney's influence over that fair in our Cartoons of the Future video. This was where he debuted many animatronic pieces that have since become fixtures at Disney parks, such as It's a Small World or The Carousel of Progress. Having conquered traditional animation and in a world without CGI, I'm sure this seemed like the next logical step, bringing animated characters into reality, the physical. Uh, to do this, Disney established Walt Disney Inc. in 1952. This was renamed WED Enterprises the following year, and is today known as Disney Imagineering. WED Imagineering was, is, the engineering department responsible for developing attractions for Disneyland. Uh, the first animatronic they designed for the park was the Enchanted Tiki Room, which opened in 1963. This attraction consists of four singing macaws of various nationalities in an environment inspired by Hawaiian and Polynesian cultures. Disney would showcase his animatronics on a large scale at the New York World's Fair, as well as in the film Mary Poppins in 1964. That same year, computer scientist Joseph Weizenbaum began developing the AI program Eliza. With Eliza, Weizenbaum intended to prove humans and machines were incapable of engaging in meaningful discourse. Eliza's intelligence was largely an illusion. It was programmed to scan the user's input for keywords and output a response that more or less parroted the input based on various scripts. The most famous of these was the Doctor script. This simulated a session between the user and a psychotherapist in which the program asked broad questions concerning the user's reason for seeking help. Despite Weizenbaum's intentions, many users reportedly developed a bond with Eliza. He believed this was because of humans' need to anthropomorphize and assign meaning to interactions, insisting Eliza was showing interest with its responses rather than simply outputting a command. This phenomenon has since become known as the Eliza effect. The use of animatronics in film had become commonplace by the 1970s for scenes too dangerous or extravagant to be performed by living beings. The best example from this time is 1975's Jaws. Bringing the shark to life required three different models and a team of 14 to operate it. As the film was shot on the ocean, production was extremely difficult. The platform used to tow the models actually sunk at one point, but this more or less launched the career of Steven Spielberg, so I guess it paid off. Later in the decade, two restaurant franchises emerged I'm sure many have nostalgia for, Chuck E. Cheese and Showbiz Pizza Place. The former was founded in 1977 by Atari co-creator Nolan Bushnell. Bushnell hoped to make gaming more appealing and accessible to children, as up until that point, video games were relegated to the pool halls and dingy arcades. Chuck E. Cheese's Pizza Time Theater would incorporate pizza with arcade cabinets and live entertainment provided by a cast of animatronic characters. You had Jasper Jowls, Helen Henney, Pascali P. Pie Plate, Mr. Munch, and of course, the titular rat, Chuck E. Cheese. Initially, the characters appeared within picture frames that helped hide the mechanism. These eventually fell out in favor of an open stage. In 1978, Bushnell left Atari and dedicated himself to expanding his pizza time empire. He attracted the attention of hotel magnate Robert L. Brock. Brock sought to franchise nearly 300 Chuck E. Cheese locations and even signed a multi-million dollar contract with Bushnell but pulled out believing the animatronics he used to be so par, and because of this, Brock feared their business would be vulnerable to competition. That competition turned out to be Aaron Fletcher of Creative Engineering Incorporated. Fletcher, who had previously created the arcade game Whack-A-Mole, dedicated the late 1970s to developing animatronic attractions. His more popular creations included Willy Wabbit and two rock bands, the Hard Luck Bears and the Wolfpack Five. These bands joined to form the supergroup The Rock of Fire Explosion. Impressed by this work, Robert Brock instead invested his money in a joint venture with Fletcher, which turned out to be the very similar Showbiz Pizza Place. 
Really, the only difference was the house band, the Rock of Fire Explosion. Billy Bob, a bass playing bear, served as the company's mascot, while frontman Fats Geronimo held it down on keys. Mitzi Mozzarella and Looney Bird provided vocals, with Duke LaRue and Beach Bear on drums and guitar respectively. Fletcher provided the voices for most of the characters and could reprogram them to perform different songs and acts. Rapid expansion, combined with the video game crash of the early 80s, caused financial issues for both Showbiz and Chuck E. Cheese, with the latter filing for bankruptcy in 1984. Chuck E. Cheese would be acquired by its competitor, and they were operated as two separate brands until 1992, when all Showbiz Pizza locations were rebranded as Chuck E. Cheese. 1993's Jurassic Park is generally lauded for its revolutionary use of CGI, but it's also notable for having the largest animatronic ever made. The film's T-Rex stood 20 feet tall and weighed 17,500 pounds. It was designed and built by Steve Williams, an animator who was also responsible for the T-1000 from T2. The model was apparently the most realistic recreation up until that point, aesthetically at least. They apparently took liberties with the way that it moved, but it's impressive nonetheless. By the late 1990s, the use of animatronics in film was largely replaced by the cheaper and easier CGI. However, the technology had advanced to the point where you can now take one home with you. Meet Furby, the hottest toy of Christmas 1998. It was created by Dave Hampton and Caleb Chung and was released by Tiger Electronics, makers of the 2XL and various handheld video games. Interactive toys had been attempted before, see Teddy Ruxpin, but none had the intelligence of Furby. Furbies could not only speak their own language, Furbish, which you could actually translate, but were capable of learning English words and phrases. They could also communicate with one another. However impressive, Furby's abilities were greatly exaggerated though. It could not learn or repeat words that were said to it, as many, myself included, believed it could. Many, including the NSA, also feared their Furbies were spying on them, despite it not being able to record, store, or broadcast material, although these features would all eventually be added. Still, Furby 98 was the first successful domesticated robot. In part two, we will see the further merger of animatronics and AI, as well as the rise of social robotics, and meet some of the people creating the future. We will also be looking at automata prior to the 20th century and other examples of animatronics over on Patreon, patreon.com slash pixandportraits, you can support us there. I'll post links to relevant material down in the description, including a banger of a documentary on the Rock of Fire explosion and childhood obsession. That's really good shit, check it out. If you enjoyed this video, please give us a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and as always, thank you so much for watching.